are chemtrails and thumbprint clouds serving as food for superbugs? In science fiction, the Frankenstein monster was created in the strong electromagnetic field of a lightning storm. In science fact, Cliff Carnicom has found that bioengineered superbugs likely respond to electromagnetic fields by virtue of the demonstrated presence of iron and ferromagnetic compounds within the superbug growth forms. This oral superbug sample reacts to a magnetic field in an astounding manner. At first, the specimen appears attracted by the magnet, but later it somehow learns how to reject the magnet and appears to reverse its own polarization. Specimen number two exhibits only one polarization in this video clip, but did specimen number two somehow learn how to reject the magnet from watching or sensing specimen number one? The Carnicom Institute is making progress in a method that will neutralize the superbug's design intended to undermine critical biological systems within the human body and to inflict a Morgellon syndrome in some of its victims. Carnicom's research has determined the important need for funding to pursue more focused and sophisticated research. Consider donating online or by mail. End note. Jet aircraft pilots and crew and contractors who participate in the chemtrails operation have likely been told that they are helping to mitigate the effects of global warming and climate change or some such. This compartmentalized mission mentality allows good people to do bad things when they don't understand the full consequences of their misrepresented mission. We ask that these military and civilian pilots, crew, contractors, and jet fuel suppliers step forward to inform the public as to what they have been told is their mission. The growing body of knowledge about the chemtrails operation is revealing more sinister motives every day. Pilots and contractors who once believed they were immune from the consequences of a covert chemtrail operation will realize they are placing dangerous compounds and biological hazards into the atmosphere that will eventually infect their bodies and expose their own families to an insidious danger. Hi, I'm Clifford Carnicum, and I am an independent researcher. Many of you are familiar with my site under my name of Carnicum.com. I'm an independent researcher on what I call the aerosol issue, aerosol crimes, uh, popularly known or referred to as chemtrails. I don't use that term, but I don't have any problem with other folks that do that. But uh, for about 10 years, I've been doing research on the aerosol issue, the deliberate introduction of uh, massive amounts of particulates into our atmosphere. Our purpose here today is not to debate or discuss the reality of that subject. It, it is to go into a much deeper subject, and that is the biological consequences uh, of these aerosol operations with a particular interest in a condition that has emerged that has been called Morgellons. Um, we will find that as I use this term, really any time in the future, and, and as well as now, I will put that term in quotes, and I think that will become clear as we talk today. I'm here with Gwen Scott, uh, Dr. Gwen Scott, a naturopathic doctor, uh, a longtime uh, friend, associate, and collaborator on research uh, that we have done over, over 10 years now with uh, a great deal of recent activity over the last three months, specifically on, again, the Morgellons issue. What I'm going to do today is take about 10 minutes and simply make the audience aware of a series of papers that I have written. I will not go into the in depth. I will not have time to go in depth. But I simply want to make the audience aware 
but these papers exist. The main subject of each paper that has evolved over the last three months. Uh, then Gwen will have some uh, time for some of her thoughts, uh, personal issues and testimony related to this issue, and then we'll have a couple of minutes at the end to, to close. So my work will basically be a chronology, and my work on this issue started in August of um, 2006. And there was an individual that presented physical samples to me of a skin condition, along with the reports that wherever she went with these samples, that she either received no information back from the doctors, or that she was ridiculed, or that she was called delusional. This is how this individual was treated. This apparently went on for several years. She sent me a sample because I could not really believe that somebody would not respond to a physical sample that she was providing. Apparently not the case. So I received the sample and I looked at this and I posted the first article on the subject. And that article uh, was called First Observations. And that was in uh, August, August of 2006. That work was posted rather phenomenal in terms of what it showed. It showed the presence of very unusual structures at the uh, submicron level under, under the microscope things that had no uh, tie or continuity with normal biological processes, uh, submicron fiber networks. And at the same time, the, the term Morgellons was emerging uh, in more popular circulation about certain people that supposedly had a skin disease, and this is how it was framed, as a subset, a small subset of the population that had this skin condition, who, by the way, were generally be, being called delusional or, or crazy along the way. That work was posted along with an appeal uh, for positive identification of the unusual structures that were being seen under the microscope at high power. That call went completely unheeded for a full year or more. Nothing happened in terms of any response to identification of these unusual biological structures. At that time, this would have been in November of last year, a second individual provided me with samples in a much more direct form. I had access to the individual and numerous physical samples were provided. Those were also looked at in great detail under the microscope. And the at that point it was different because I had a match. I had only had the one sample from one individual for a whole year. At that point when the second individual came in I had numerous samples to look at and there was an exact match to the T, an exact match with that first sample of a year ago. And in the end there are about four basic forms that are showing up on, on my side under the microscope. They are as follows. One would be what I call an encasing filament or a, bound, a bounding filament. A filament that is usually barely visible to the human eye but within it a second structure exists, and that's a sub-micron network. So you have a bounding filament. A human hair is roughly on the order of 60 to 100 microns thick. This encasing filament is on the order of 12 to 20 microns. So you can see it with the visible light. It has, it has a similarity in appearance to a hair, but certainly you will find that it is not a hair when you look at it under proper magnification under the scope. So the second form is within the bounding filament, and this is a sub-micron network of fibers or filaments. The third form is that um, it's a coccus form, it appears. It appears to have strong similarities to what would be called a coccus bacterial form, uh, a spherical form. These structures are measuring at the sub-micron level also. Approximately a half to seven-tenths of a micron is the best size that I can come up with. And the fourth structure is what I'm right now calling a hybrid form. And this is something which is somewhat in between. It's somewhat of a transition between the filament and that uh, coccus form that I'm speaking of, although it's aligned more closely to the uh, filament form. It's just not uh, as long and not as irregular in its appearance. These are four basic forms which are appearing over and over and over. There is a chronology of papers on my site starting at that uh, period of November of last year up until literally a couple of weeks ago, which continues to examine different biological samples from numerous individuals. And the work is at the point now where you have samples coming across literally all of the major systems of the human body. 
examples would be uh, uh, samples from the hair, uh, the scalp, um, uh, dental samples, which Gwen will talk uh, quite a bit about later. Uh, you have uh, the same filament, and actually all four forms exist Three of them commonly occur in the outward manifestation of the body. That hybrid form is occurring primarily in the blood samples, it appears. Um, but you have a series of articles which continue to document the same forms over and over and over, crossing the, the hair, the uh, dental and gum uh, system of the body, saliva, um, urinary tract, um, the ear, the blood, crossing all major um, functions of the human body. Now, the reason that this issue has come, in and to come into prominence is because not only has there been a finding of these uh, unused, I call them pathogens, I can come up with no other term than uh, that these are pathogens, these are in invaders of the human body which cause uh, uh, ill health or, or certainly um, I don't know how you can avoid the condition of calling it a disease in that sense, but Gwen and I have our own thoughts on this. But certainly the condition of the blood that I'm seeing over and over and over is not a, is not a healthy one. You have two things that are important here, I think, to identify. One would be that those individuals that were, let's say, segregated or classified as being something very, an unusual segment of the population that had this condition called Morgellons, again in quotes, is plain false from what I can see. It is not, in the end, a small segment of the population that is to be isolated and segregated you know, as something unusual. In fact, the information and evidence is indicating that these same pathogenic forms, although they were originally found, it, it is true that those individuals that were classified as having Morgellons, in, again in quotes, those individuals called these forms to attention. This is where it first was examined, because you had something physical manifesting outside of the body, skin, for example. So it is true that these individuals called attention to the problem. However, when you start looking at those same conditions that were, were arrived at within that individual, it is seen that these same physical conditions are applying themselves, it appears, to the entire, or let's say to the general population. It's hard to avoid that conclusion right now. We have you know, 18 individuals across uh, three to four state lines that have contributed physical samples thus far, and the same identical pathogenic forms, again, I can come up with no other proper term than that they are a pathogen, uh, are occurring in these individuals. And the only distinction that I can make with the so-called Morgellons individual is that you simply have an outward or visible manifestation or visible form um, with that individual. But if you get into the blood and you get inside the body in these major systems, the same forms are occurring with all. Okay? So that's certainly one of the main points that I wanted to make in terms of the, the distribution of this condition. The classification of Morgellons as something specific to a few individuals appears to be entirely false. And the only conclusion I can come to at this point is that it certainly appears that the general state of health of the general population um, has been affected or degraded by the presence of these pathogens. The next important point that needs to be made is the connection with the aerosol issue. At, from one perspective, a person could simply examine the so-called Morgellons condition, and you have a field day in itself in terms of trying to explain what it is that you're seeing. That's a valid subject in itself which deserves a whole lot more uh, attention than it's received thus far. But unfortunately, there has been the linking by direct physical evidence of the so-called Morgellons condition with airborne samples that now have a history extending back 10 years. In particular, a set of samples that was sent to the United States Environmental Protection Agency at the beginning of my work, close to being 1999 or 2000, and the subsequent refusal of the United States Environmental Protection Agency to identify that material. If you now look at the uh, microscopic level, very high magnification, you will find a direct parallel in form, structure, and size between that very sample that the EPA refused to identify. Basically, three out of those 
four, four forms that I spoke of, you will see within that single sample that the EPA refused to identify. And so obviously the, the problem here is that it appears as though there is a direct link between um, environmental contaminants um, and environmental samples and the subsequent biological manifestations that are occurring, not only within a certain class of individuals that have been given a name, but unfortunately it looks like they extend themselves through the general population. I'm going to pass right now um, this subject over to Dr. Scott um, to give her a time for her thoughts and then at the end we'll come back for a couple minutes and also I wanted to mention that I hope that in the future we can have a couple more sessions like this, but I wanted to open the door and at least get some general information out there because there, there's actually indications that even the alternative press in some ways is not being, let's say, quite um, um, as open in the disclosure of some of the information as I think might be helpful to us. So, Gwen, I wanted to thank you very much for being uh, here today. Um, this time we're both under the camera. Last time we did some work with just you under the camera. Sure. But I wanted to thank you for being here and give you a few minutes to get some of your thoughts on this issue. And thank you very much. Well, I have to thank you, and I think every human on this planet, Clifford, has to thank you. You spent nothing but the last ten years of your life with nothing coming to you doing this work. So on behalf of humanity, thank you. And Thank also you. your beautiful wife, who's been patient unbelievably right. throughout this process. Right. Thank you. Um, uh, dovetailing what Clifford was saying, this is not a disease, folks, uh, and that's, that's a terrible misleading that's going on in Morgellons disease. I've been working with this, com it, it, well, it's a network of things for a couple of three years now. At first I had no clue what I was working with, using my own body basically as a laboratory and I began to see that there are a lot of components. Uh, Morgellons was just a name put on this because people were demonstrating something through their skin, as Clifford mentioned, which later under the microscope we begin to see very unusual forms. But it is a very compound, complex network of pathogens, organic, inorganic, and all kinds of things. Uh, fibers, we have heavy metals, we have bacterias, funguses, viruses all kinds of things that seem to be working somehow synergistically, uh, none, of, none of them good to the human body and human health. Um, I, did, I was able to touch base with one of the people who actually was involved in the design of some of this, and I think at the time he thought he was doing his country some good, uh, and in retrospect now realizes perhaps not, and so he's trying very hard to help anybody who's conscious of what's going on and he did tell me uh, that most of these pathogens have been genetically altered so that some uh, your immune system doesn't even know that they're there uh, they're, they're cloaked uh, they're they're different they can overcome and um, I won't go into specifics but just to say these are not your average bacteria virus fungus and uh, of course heavy metals are not average in the human body anyway and these fibers, these unusual fibers or wires that we're seeing. Uh, people have said, well, where is it coming from? Well, clearly, uh, uh, there's been enough air sample to know, and Mr. Carnicon Clifford just made that connection for us, through the air. And remember, folks, and this is something people forget. We've sort of disconnected. Hopefully, we can reconnect with some very important things today. Um, whatever you breathe in is systemic or system-wide to your whole body in less than a minute. And these things that we're talking about here are very small, tiny, tiny, tiny particles goes into the lungs, go directly into the blood supply. No oversight, uh, nobody knows, you know, this is a slow process of discovery, can be changed on any given day without our permission or knowledge. So it's pretty disturbing when you think about it. But we do know that some of these at least are coming into us with deliberation through the air supply. Uh, I have been told by this same gentleman that it is also be, being delivered to us through our food supply, particularly um, commercial uh, pre-processed, pre pre-produced foods. Something to think about in terms of your diet. And also I have a personal belief, I have no proof, that perhaps through inoculation 
a willing inoculation for many years. Um, that, well, I say willing, we were sort of told we had to get all those inoculations. But anyway, so there you go. Um, one of the things I think that is most disturbing about these times that even the people who are conscious or aware, if they're not demonstrating fibers coming out of their bodies, they go, well, I'm sorry for those people, but it's not me. What I am discovering along with Clifford over time here is that every single human that goes through a series of sampling and testing seems to have this condition. I, I don't even want to call it Morgellons. It's a compound complex assault on the body. One of the couple of things, and you know, by law, as a naturopathic doctor, uh, I cannot diagnose or prescribe to you. But what I can do is educate you and share some of my own personal experiences. And one of those was I had a very, what I thought, bad, bad toothache one day. Um, it was so bad, I kind of went under the covers and said, help, <laughs> to the higher kingdom. And it, it came to me that rinsing my mouth with red wine, red wine, would help. And I did, and the results of that were astounding, uh, terrifying, and stupefying. Uh, all of these fibers came flying out, and you can see that work on Mr. Carnicom, carnicom.com website. You can see the photographs. That was probably two months ago, and to this day, twice a day, I do that, I do that therapy, uh, and it continues to produce, perhaps not as much, but thousands and thousands and thousands uh, from the, the, the chin, the teeth, the gums. Uh, and that's something, clearly, if, you, if you're interested, um, what I do is I put a little peroxide around the teeth and gums, and I use a little bit of dental floss to kind of get it in there, and then I vigorously swish one side of the mouth five or six or seven times and then move to the other. First swishing usually doesn't produce very much, but by the second or third swishing. This is not a recommendation or a cure or anything like that, uh, but a simple in-home thing that you can do, test to see if perhaps you too might have some of this going on. Another something that you can do is take your own body temperature. Uh, one thing that has been noticed is that uh, without exception, every human I have met, when they take a consistent body temperature testing every day, falls way below the normal 98.6 that we're supposed to be. Uh, there are people who are down in the 94, 95 range consistently. But most everyone, if not everyone, whose temperature uh, we take ends up being very, very low. And that's something else you can do in indicating that perhaps things are a little crooked the reason I think this is important is if not for yourself, okay, say you don't care about yourself, but I know you love somebody, you have children, you have a mom or a dad, a brother or a sister, you know, you can just sort of look away or do the ostrich thing, but believe me, whether you and yours are dealing with the chemtrails, the aerosol spraying or not, it's dealing with you. And if we don't begin to accept that as difficult as it is, and for most people of consciousness and good heart, it's inconceivable that anyone would want to harm uh, their fellow man that way, by coming to the uh, recognition that perhaps they, there are some folks who do, and for what reason I have no clue, um, then you have to somehow enjoin, you have to somehow decide that it, it that it it is touching your life and, and in a big way. Um, ways that I have noticed and been able to sort of track uh, through myself and friends and family and clients is a, a sort of a premature aging and that affects every body part. Um, hair loss, all kinds of things, joint pains. And as I go along on the discovery, I'm beginning to understand that more and more of what we associate with aging and ill health can be directly related back to this system, um, this very kind of compound complex mix that's coming into us, all of them taking tolls on one f in one way or another. Um, if you are working, and I do suggest that you do, work with an enlightened uh, practitioner, it's very important that they understand that we have a new paradigm, health paradigm that we're working with now, and they need to become educated about all of the things coming into us. And uh, if you go to Mr. Carnicom's website, I did post a paper there, a very extensive paper about my own personal journey 
through this and in there there's some suggestions please not on your own but work with an enlightened practitioner um, take you're welcome to take any of that information to him or her uh, to, to help you and yours achieve optimum health just a few final comments everybody says to me well okay what do I do <laughs> Well, I think the first thing you do is what you're doing right now is becoming aware, uh, educating yourself, becoming conscious, because knowledge is always the beginning. And then after that, follow your, your soul, follow your spirit, um, go and meditate, do whatever it is that you need to do, because everybody can contribute uh, something positive uh, to, the, to these times. So you'll have to find what your journey is and what your contribution could be. I would only say to you to do nothing um, is, it would be sad because every contribution means something. And I would also say it's, it's hard not to get angry. It's hard not to come right back at it with, uh, well, anger and hatred and they should, you know, whatever and all that stuff. But in my opinion, um, that it's that energy that got us where we are right now um, and that that even though this is so difficult to approach this way to me it seems the only way which is with love and compassion and um, kindness and all the light side energy um, because in the end it's the most powerful and uh, I think can offset uh, the same person that came to me said so much of what's going on is vibrational um, and if you look at Mr. Carnicon Clifford's website, you'll see a lot about frequencies. And we know that anger and hatred and judgment all carry a very dense negative frequency, whereas love like compassion carries a different frequency. So that in and of itself is good medicine. Um, as I go along through this process with myself and my friends and my clients, I will continue to update whatever observations I have about the nature and potential mitigating uh, natural remedies that you can uh, consider. As I said, please work with a professional healthcare practitioner. And uh, in closing here, really, I just want to say anybody watching this, bless you. Bless you for being conscious and bless you for caring. And uh, I know Mr. Carnicom Clifford has a few closing thoughts. Yeah, I just want to uh, thank you very much, Gwen, and you know, I hope we get the chance to meet again uh, soon on this, and I suspect um, it might be helpful to have just more of a dialogue maybe the next time, but it's helpful to get some of the really just introductory. We're just trying to raise the issue uh, on this, and uh, you know, one comment that with respect to this um, test that Gwen described with uh, the wine, unfortunately this is not an anomaly. This does not appear something to be something that is extremely unusual. Uh, it's unusual what, what is being seen, but this is not something restricted to a single individual. What has happened thus far in the tests that she has described, this is very real that we're speaking of, and this is why we're, we're presenting this in, in a video. This is real, this is physical. And thus far there have been 18 people is our latest count right 18 people we could essentially call this a random sample from across the country numerous states now have have conducted this very same test and I'm not a doctor at all and I don't claim to be a doctor in any way and I'm not offering a cure in fact we don't know one tenth one hundredth of what is going on but we do know that there is a specific physical test that has been established. Gwen is the one that discovered this. And thus far, on essentially a random sample of 18 people across the country, every single one of them, every single one of them is producing the same physical forms, which I must declare the best that I can as being a pathogenic form. These are not meant to be in the human body, what is being seen here. I'm not going to swear that every single person across the country and in the general population has this, but certainly, statistically, we're way beyond any norm. So I would like the audience to become involved to the point where they are aware that this is a physical manifestation which appears as though it may be affecting the general population, not something that we shove off to being a few folks like they treated lepers in the past. I also want to... Um, 
let it be known how the CDC has responded to this issue. And if we're counting on the federal government to and the federal agencies to give us the, the scoop and the lowdown on this issue, we've got a very serious problem. Because if you look at the CDC's uh, history here, they have been anywhere from completely ignoring the issue. They've taken several tactics, several along the way, and they change according to what appears to be appropriate for them at the time. One is complete refusal and denial to even acknowledge the subject. The next stage they got into was one of, of labeling the, the condition as delusional. They put it up on their website that this is a delusion, falling right in line again with a tactic that was used. Then there appeared to have been pressure applied to that agency and they removed the delusional reference. And, and acknowledge that such a thing might exist in some form, but we don't know anything about it, that we're going to do a study, but nothing happened. This was on for at least a year and a half. They declared an intent, nothing happens. It then evolves to the point where there's a press club, a national press club, where there's an acknowledgement of the issue. And what do they do there? They say that we're going to study this. There's no sufficient funds established for a study. The study is, is confined to a specific group of people with a specific health organization, you know, Kaiser Health Organization, a very specific test. And who's the um, main scientific, um, uh, let's say, arbit arbitrator of this? The, the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology. Okay? This is who is supposedly evaluating the, the reality of this condition will be the military. So, and now we're at the point where there supposedly will be some information released a year and a half on this specific group of people. So if we're counting on the CDC or the general press to um, help us circulate information, there's obviously a problem. This is one of the reasons that Gwen and I are together here. On, on my side, there is a very, um, there is a call for an appeal for assistance for positive identification. A lot of my work is specific uh, under the microscope. It's not something that's nebulous. There are very specific forms that are repeatedly showing up now. And they need positive identification, not, uh, not a maybe, not might be. We need positive uh, uh, microbiological uh, description, identification of what's there. And if it's a little bit beyond the ordinary, we need to know that as well. And, and my hope is that we're able to meet again, Gwen, and maybe just in a more um, conversational mode, go over some of the yeah. things that we're finding. And, and fi uh, what I would want to say is please, 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 this isn't something you let somebody else take care of. If you do not become involved, if you look back through human history, and when there was a big problem afoot, and, you, and the people turned away, now we condemn them and say, well, why didn't they do something? Well... We've got another big problem here, and it may, and I, I hope I'm not overstating, but <clears throat> I think the health and survival of all human beings uh, is truly at stake here, and so we can't afford to say, well, I'm busy today, or i got family problems, or, ooh, that's scary, I don't want to get involved. You really, um, it's a soul call out. <laughs> I don't think it's an exaggeration, and that's why, you know, Gwen and I are motivated um, to, to do this. Um, we're speaking of something which has the potential, if not actually already doing so, and that is affecting the general state of the health of the population. On the whole and, planet. Yes, and, and with a great deal of evidence uh, can be attributed to, to um, very specific uh, environmental operations and programs yes. that are being conducted. And, and with that, uh, I would like to thank you for listening and thank you, Gwen. And I look forward to meeting with you soon again and see if we can get into a little more detail on some of the things we've been doing. Peace and blessings. Thank you, Mike. Hi, this is Clifford Tarnicum again here uh, with Dr. Gwen Scott, a naturopathic doctor. And Gwen, thanks a whole lot for being here. Thank you. And we're here for the second time around uh, to present additional information regarding the condition that has been classified or called uh, Morgellons, I'll put it in quotes all the time. Uh, the more that uh, you listen to us, you may understand the reason for that. Uh, it appears to be very much a false characterization as a disease uh, that is restricted to a few individuals that we treat with some special disinterest um, as opposed to interest. And so today what I want to do on my side was just go into a little bit more detail, particularly visually. I would like um, 
the audience to be able to see uh, photographs of some of the forms. I have to call them pathogenic forms. I can come up with no other explanation. These are foreign to the human body. Uh, pathogenic forms that are being repeatedly identified over and over and over, whether an individual is manifesting this condition at the skin level or not. In fact, one of the characteristics is that these pathogenic forms, although originally uh, discovered and called to attention by individuals that e exhibited unusual skin conditions, the unfortunate finding is that these very same forms that are occurring even at the skin level are being found really across the board uh, within uh, essentially the, the broad population the way it is now. The number is up to 26 people that have performed a certain uh, test that we've talked about and we'll talk about more. Now, all 26 of them are manifesting and the only, the only difference that I could characterize with the so-called Morgellons condition is that the degree or severity or extent of the um, pathogenic forms would appear to be greater. Uh, that's the furthest that I could go right now, but in terms of presence and distribution, uh, there is no exclusion right now of the general population uh, from what it is that is being discovered. So with that, what I wanted to do today was uh, use some of the time I had to present some photographs to you, and I'll overlay these photographs on the screen for you to see. And I want to go through the four forms that are being identified. My whole objective here is I want these things identified. That's just what this is about. It's not okay to say you're seeing something over and over in the human body that is clearly foreign uh, and causes um, ill conditions, disease, or ill health, whatever you want to call it within the human body, present this information publicly in a way that can be repeated over and over and over. Anything that I could do is quite easy um, to describe the methods. I won't say easy in terms of equipment. You need a good microscope here. But the fact is it's very much repeatable and could be done with anyone with adequate resources. It is my objective to have these four forms identified. I have mentioned them in the previous um, meeting you and I had, Gwen. Today I'd like to go over some of the photographs of these so you see them. These four forms that are being repeatedly identified are as follows. The first is what I call an enclosing or a bounding filament. Um, this filament um, will often exhibit itself, exhibit itself from skin lesions. This is true. This is how they were first discovered. Um, uh, in, the, in the sores that appear on the skin, an unusual fiber form can appear. Of course, a casual person might think it's a hair, and this would be an argument that might be made initially. That won't hold up at all, will not hold up once you subject that to scrutiny or examination. The first form is this bounding form. A human hair is on the order of roughly 60 to 100 microns thick. The fiber that is showing up here at the skin level is on the order of roughly, roughly 12 to 20 microns. It's not fixed. There's some variability, but roughly in the order of 12 to 20 microns thick. The photograph that I'm showing you now, um, you see the basically exterior, the full, the full size of that fiber. Now, what becomes unique then at this point is the second form, and the second form is contained, often contained within this bounding or encasing filament. The second form is that of a submicron. Anytime you're dealing with things down at the submicron level, especially if you're breathing them, you certainly ought to, ought to have concern. We all know the attention that's been given to the presence of asbestos fibers in an environment, environment over the years. Asbestos fibers measure on the order of two microns uh, in thickness. If I start speaking to you of something that's being found, it shows every reason to be coming through um, uh, uh, airborne and respiratory methods coming into your system at the submicron level, it certainly forms a basis for attention, investigation, and concern. And you will see within this bounding or encasing filament a submicron network. We're not talking about a single fiber. It is just absolutely packed with these submicron forms of parallel alignments of filaments. Well, we'll talk a little bit more about similarity of fungus a little bit later, but let's just get through the pictures first. So that's number one and two of the forms. Number three is, uh, technically we'll describe it as an oblate or a spherical structure. The best identification and, and the size of this, size is important because it helps to identify um, um, microbiological forms. It's an extremely important characteristic to be determined the size of something. You can often eliminate many things from consideration just by knowing the size alone. This particular oblate structure 
Best measurement I can come up with is on the order of roughly five tenths to seven tenths of a micron. The best identification that I can make, I'm not a medical doctor, I will repeat that, there is no diagnosis being made here, there is no medical prescription or advice being made, I'm acting as an independent researcher providing my analysis and observation for information to the public. But the best identific identification I can make of this form is consideration of what is called chlamydia pneumonia, which is a rather exotic bacterial form. I am not saying this is chlamydia pneumonia. I am saying there are eight conditions that I have established that have been matched that would establish this as a leading contender for examination for identification. Remember, I'm after the identification. The best that I can do right now is provide the imagery to you to, to establish a path for investigation. But chlamydia pneumonia is a candidate. Chlamydia pneumonia is in a very unusual and rather exotic bacterial form. If you look at the classification schemes, it, classification schemes it's sort of totally separate from any uh, generic bacterial form. And one of the reasons that it is unique is that this particular bacterial form lives within cells, okay, intracellular. That is a remarkable property when you're talking about the immune system and its ability to detect the existence of a foreign element. If it's within the cell, you've complicated your problem a great deal. Chlamydia pneumonia is involved with many, many diseases um, that are certainly characteristic of our times uh, and that are increasing in frequency and distribution in, let's say, um, not exactly an explainable way. I will offer that as at least a leading contender, not restricted to, as a contender for examination or identification of these forms. And the last is what I have to call a hybrid form, and it's simply because it's uh, somewhat unexplainable to me at this point what, what even form you're speaking of. could be in the mycoplasma uh, category, but it's basically a ribbon structure. Um, has some similarity to a filament network, but certainly not, not anything of the uniformity of the, of the second form that I've described to you. Um, and this particular form will exist also repeatedly within the blood samples that are being done. It's also true that these four forms are showing themselves across all major systems of the body. This is not something we're talking about that's restricted uh, to a skin fiber. All major systems of the body are repeatedly showing these forms. This includes the, the hair, the skin, the, the digestive system, the urinary system, saliva, ear. It is across the board throughout the human body that these forms are being um, found. The second important point here, that, that is the four forms that exist, the second point to, to make that's very important in this would be the link with the aerosol issue. And that is that there is, as of now, a rather direct physical link that has been established between these same forms that I have just uh, um, itemized for you that are being found in biological samples. There is an exact match with respect to form, size, shape, structure with environmental samples that have been repeatedly identified again uh, over the past 10 years. One of those samples in particular being sent to the United States Environmental Protection Agency for identification on behalf of the public welfare. The subsequent refusal of that agency to identify that material, let alone even acknowledge its existence. And of these four forms, three of them have crossed over directly into the environmental airborne a filament form. You have that encasing filament, you have the submicron network, and you have the what appears to be similar to a bacterial form uh, within that airborne environmental sample. So this is where um, a sufficient link and basis has been established for a connection between the environmental contaminants that we have been subject to in the aerosol operation and the subsequent manifestation in the biological form. The last one, and we'll come back maybe at the end, but I'm also going to put a photograph here of a, a dental um, sample that you and I have talked about at rather great length, at least between us, involving a, a test, and it is a test. It is not a cure for anything, but it is a test that many people may wish to um, uh, perform involving the use of, of red wine and or negotiably um, uh, peroxide. We'll talk about that maybe a little bit more, but certainly the original foundation was discovered by uh, um, Dr. Scott Gwinscott uh, using wine, red wine, a deep dark red wine alone. 
and we can consider that somewhat of a, a gift at this point, but the, again, it is not a cure. We'll talk about that more at the end on your side since you're the one that discovered that. Uh, I have a couple more points I'd like to make today. The second one has to do with a conference that has been recently held. Apparently this conference was titled the first Morgellons Annual Conference, if I have that right, uh, held fairly recently. The conference appears to have called together uh, serious researchers and to give, um, let's say, credibility to the, um, to the issue of this um, emerging and or now pervasive um, condition. And it may be just that. It may be a first professional organization and presentation of information at that level. That's fine. Uh, on the same token, however, I'd like to at least, let's say, make the audience aware that we might want to monitor how information regarding the subject is presented to the public, um, especially being alert for information that is inconsistent, which, that, um, which has been established by independent means. One comment in particular that came out of this conference that caught my attention was a, a coverage was coverage by a CBS affiliate, affiliate. They went there on television there and covered this, and um, said that they were the only television station to cover this event. They put a big headline on their television uh, presentation that said, "You know, this Morgellons condition. It may be that as many as 14,000 people across the world may have this condition." and presented in somewhat of an astounding fashion. Unfortunately, the work that uh, Gwen and I have both worked on now uh, for really several years, but especially over the past several months with, uh, let's say, greater intensity, the unfortunate, unfortunate finding here is that the evidence and information indicates that we are speaking of something that is much of much broader distribution than you can imagine, that mentioning 14,000 people as containing certain uh, conditions is absolutely ludicrous from what I can see, and that the audience should seriously consider that the extent of what we are speaking of here may easily involve billions of people, and this is not an exaggeration. The majority of the population of the world may be under consideration here, and it is not fair in any way for any conference that is fairly considering the information to restrict this as some segregated group of unusual people that have something um, that we can push off for another two or years, two years as the CDC is trying to do. Third comment would be, well actually I've made this point um, strong enough already at this point, and that is the tie-in between what is being found biologically manifesting in the body and that of an environmental sample. I think I've made that point strong enough for today. The last comment would be that this information that has been presented publicly, open view under the, under the microscope with the best resources I have, has now been out there close to a year and a half. The first photographs of these unusual forms came out now close to a year and a half ago. To think that we're at the point that a year and a half later, with now rather intense work over the last several months, of presenting repeatable um, images that show uh, very unusual forms, which appear by all means to be pathogenic, and to not have those forms positively identified is absolutely atrocious. There is no excuse for this whatsoever, and it is one of my primary objectives at this point. We'll go further later on, but at this point there's absolutely no excuse for having these four specific forms. This is a minimum, four specific forms identified as to nature and function. And in fact, um, out of the conference that is going on, it's, it's, um, it's really not very sensible that, oh, we're now getting to the point where we can see some images on this. We've had some images now for at least a year and a half. So this is, this is my primary calling at this point. Get these things identified, and then we'll go further in terms of understanding what the effect is. And with that, oh, and the last thing was that there has been. There has been no suitable identification thus far. It's totally, totally void, basically, of, of clarity, um, and definition. And with that last comment, I'd like to pass things over to you, Gwen. I hope I didn't infringe on your time there too much, no, but we're no, going to no, do no, this no. again as, as much as we need to to get the information out. So I thank you very Take much. Take all the time you want, Thanks. my friend. Um, okay, I have some new developments using my own body laboratory, which is what I've been doing all along, and friends and family and whatever. Uh, but before I talk about that, I will say since our last discussion, I did have a gentleman who was involved in the design of some of this. 
called me, and when he when he was involved, he said, you know, he felt he was doing something to help the soldiers in the field in this country. They, he was told that these things would be sprayed, aerosol sprayed from planes on the enemy, and they would save soldiers' lives. And then it occurred to him when he became aware and began to see uh, Clifford's work and other work that, oops, you know, maybe that's not the case. So now he's trying really hard to help out anybody that he can find that's trying to do the work. And he explained something to me that I knew but I had kind of forgotten, which is every organ in your body has a specific frequency. And it, it, it operates at that frequency. And when you interrupt that frequency electromagnetically, you can create all kinds of serious, even unto death, problems. He also talked about areas of the brain um, and mind control. And uh, as Orwellian as that may seem, apparently, scientifically, it's very real. And we know from Clifford's work uh, for years now, the electromagnetic properties of what's happening in our air supply as a result of the aerosol spraying and the manipulation of that. Beyond that, he talked about and confirmed to me the heavy metals, the barium, the titanium, uh, the aluminum, uh, none of which, trust me, are good for the human, uh, the fibers. He felt that the fibers were metallic in nature. Uh, he talked about the biological. He said all of it has been altered. Uh, some of it, uh, and Clifford alluded to it earlier, can kind of escape your immune system, cloak itself in one form or another. Um, again, the electromagnetics. And also the lack of oxygen, the displacement of oxygen. And Clifford talked about that at the beginning of his work, that the more you displace or rid oxygen out of the air supply, with particulates, it could be cornflakes, it doesn't matter, mortality rates go up concurrently. And we are operating on a very low level of oxygen because of the displacement. So that alone doesn't, you know, it, it, forget all the components. That alone is very detrimental uh, to the human body. And as Clifford was talking about earlier, um, the red blood cell, whose job it is to carry oxygen, has been compromised. So we, we, it's actually pretty amazing that any of us are walking and talking. An article was brought to me done by a research doctor in the 50s talking about a condition called dysbiosis, which is uh, fungal overgrowth in the human body and what happens to the body, to the organs, to the person as, as that fungus, which is very aggressive, and in those days, probably just candida, uh, overtakes the human body and the resulting nanobacteria, on and on and on, that come out of that kind of circumstance, which he blamed primarily on the use of antibiotics. I'm seeing, I believe, uh, something very similar to that, where people literally fail because the fungus overtakes. I do have a friend who's a surgeon who told me they have opened people up now in operating rooms and close them back up because their organs are so covered with this fungal matter they can't find the organs. So I feel assured that's at least a component. With that in mind, folks, fungus does not do well if you don't feed it sugar. And I know that's hard news for a lot of people who love their sweets, but fungus cannot survive in a sugar-free environment, or at least average fungus, we don't know. But it would be something to consider to try to eliminate all sweets. If you can't do a little raw honey, that would be the best option. But sugar feeds this problem, so something to think about. And again, I am a naturopathic doctor, but most states do not license me. And that means I cannot diagnose, nor can I prescribe. What I'm doing here is informing you, which I am allowed to do, educate and inform through empirical uh, observation of self and people that I have worked with, but I am not. You need to find a good, enlightened practitioner. Feel free to share any and all information that I'm sharing with you with the practitioner, either her or him, uh, and work together that way with a professional. I wouldn't try to cowboy this circumstance. I've done it, and I've brought myself right to the uh, ragged edge of 
the great beyond. So don't do that. I'm trying to run ahead and I'm slamming myself pretty hard with a lot of different things to see what's in here, to see how I can help mitigate the process for other people. As Clifford said, and I do believe he's right, um, pretty much everybody I know has some form of involvement and it can be very easily determined through blood sample, uh, this, the wine spit test um, where you just rinse your mouth with deep red wine uh, and spit. Um, so that said, when you begin to follow Herring's Law of Cure, which is brilliant, top to bottom, in to out, cure, in to out, and in the reverse order in which it came in, you begin to demonstrate on a topical level, and I've had a lot of people get in touch with me with these horrible rashes, itchy, burning, stinging like glass shards, and I'm very familiar with that. <coughs> I'm currently dealing with it because I've been pushing very, very hard. Um, and I will tell you, I have found something that helps mitigate it dramatically. But before I go further, it occurred to me today, why I don't know, to get the black light out and look at, because it seemed it was pretty shiny, uh, all this rash. And sure enough, it, it's luminescent. Um, so there is a luminescent material, either plastic, some people have suggested silicone, that is integrated into this whole system with the fibers and perhaps the bacteria and fungus and all of this that's presenting itself uh, pretty much all over my body now as a rash, a very painful rash. So uh, it's, it's, it's fluorescent, go figure, uh, not normal to the human body. Um, people, I did talk about this in my paper, uh, black light with the uh, pupils, be very careful with your eyes, you don't want to do that with a black light for very long at all because you can burn your retina, but you can see very quickly if your pupils are luminescent. I haven't found a human yet that it isn't true. Um, on CNN, very quickly, uh, some of this came to light uh, with Anderson Cooper, he did a, a series called Planet in Peril, and in that he had his blood tested. and. Uh, very surprising to him and everyone else is he came back with very high plastic and they sort of dismissed that as oh microwaving with plastic and all of that well I can promise you I do not microwave period plastic or no plastic um, very careful I store most of my food in glass and I can go on and on so and I've been driving and had huge globs of clear liquid hit my windshield and you know you try to wash it off and it smears 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 so I have a pretty good idea, I think, of where that might be coming from. I will get to the mitigation of the rash, but I do want to say I've noticed that a lot of people in their 40s, 50s, and 60s now need joint replacement, knees, hips, even a thumb, I heard, and shoulder. I thought, what's going on here? These are fairly healthy people, have not abused, they're not marathon runners, they haven't, you know, repeated trauma. Why is everybody needing this? A uh, friend made a joke, the uh, 60s, the new 80, not very funny. Um, and I'm beginning to understand because in this last big push of pushing this, these pathogens out of my system, uh, they first came out in hordes, uh, elbows, knees, ankles, in other words, hips, joints. And I can't help but think, I have no proof, but they were residing in those areas and perhaps causing me a lot of problem and maybe the degradation um, of, of those joints. It certainly doesn't have to do with are you taking a calcium supplement. Believe me, calcium does not even go into cartilage, so neither does blood. So it's, it's something getting into the cartilage, maybe the synovial fluids and compromising those systems. Best out, best to get these things out. Some things I have found helpful, we'll get to the helpful part here. Uh, full spectrum digestive enzymes seem to be very helpful because a lot of people are having gastrointestinal concerns. So your local health store should have uh, full spectrum digestive enzymes. Again, please avoid all sugar. And you probably want to add in garlic is an excellent antifungal. Um, well, garlic's full spectrum, antibacterial, antifungal. It's really good if you can find those things and hit everybody at once. Um, garlic. Paldiarco tea and capsules I found very helpful. Um, there is a company called Herbs Etc. I mentioned in my paper on Clifford's site that makes a couple of extracts that I found very helpful. 
And to mitigate the rash, believe it or not, I went into Walgreens and there was a lovely young woman in there. And she said, oh, and she knows I'm a naturopath. I have a new cream from Israel and it's, it's all natural and it, it, it's, it's wonderful. And this is what it's called. It's called Yes to Carrots. Now, I don't have any financial connection with this whatsoever or any product I ever talk about. Okay, let's just get that straight. And it's called Yes to Carrots, and it's a cream. And she, that day, my arm was on fire. I felt like I was strapped on a, a mound of fire ants. And I put it on, and it will sting. It stung for about 30 seconds. But then everything went quiet, and it was truly blessed relief. And I guess that's, that's five or six days ago. And uh, I've found a great deal of relief with the rash, the attending rash, with this product. I've tried many, many other things, and this did the best job. And finally, there was a gentleman who emailed Clifford saying, look, I'm an alcoholic, I'm a recovering alcoholic, I can't put the red wine in my mouth and swish it around. Uh, is there anything else to do? And I thought, gosh, I wish I thought of that, and I apologize. Oh, this is my pal, Gabriel, <laughs> bringing some love to the proceedings. Um, anyway, um, I thought about it, and I don't know if the alcohol has that much significance. It might be uh, the tannin in the grape. It could be the revesertol in the uh, skin of the grape. I'm not sure, but it might be worth it to try purple grape juice. Now, I, between now and the next time we meet, I will get some purple grape juice and give it a shot. But for those who are uh, alcohol restricted, it's at least a thought to try that. I'm sorry I didn't think of that before, but you could try some purple grape juice for the mouth swishing and see if that helps. And I'll do it myself and, and then talk about it next time. Um, so in closing, um, as hard as it may be, uh, it's really true, better out than in. Uh, these things are not normal or natural to your body. They are not assisting your body. Um, and I have a feeling there's a laundry list of ways that these things are harming us in ways that we cannot even begin to understand. So the process at this point has been difficult and painful for me, and I'm trying to get ahead of it so that when people do start to cleanse themselves of that which does not belong in the human body, that I can have found some mitigating things to make it less painful, less difficult. I pray that there's something that it could ha we could do and there'd be no uh, pain or problem. I'm not sure that's achievable, but at least to knock it down where the average person could deal with this cleansing of the unknowns, fibers, and Lord mercy, uh, out of the body. And if you read my paper, I do make suggestions uh, about my own journey to this point in time. Gwen, I wanted to thank you for all that work that you're doing. I hope that people do uh, realize the contributions that are, have been made here um, by Gwen on uh, trying to get uh, methods that are accessible to us, accessible yeah. and affordable to us, and uh, there's a great deal that uh, um, is to be appreciated. You know, in our, in our closing, just a couple comments I wanted to make. Um, uh, one with respect to the fungal question. It's an interesting question to me because I have to go by identification and try to use the conventional forms, uh, conventional resources, even though there is strong reason to believe that we're dealing with things that are unconventional um, and, and not in the standard books. But nevertheless, this question of the fungus has, has been there for some time. And even though it is true, I cannot, this, particularly this uh, submicron filament form, although I cannot attach it at this point, to any conventional or known fungal form, it's still, nevertheless, in terms of if we look at the, the behavior and characteristics and style of this form, it certainly has uh, many characteristics that would be aligned with the fungal characteristics. You know, we don't know the final answer, but we know we're coming from different sides, but we're trying to merge this information over time. And, you know, I'm amazed by the tenacity and persistence of this material. Mm. Uh, and and uh, I have, it's been to the point now we're on the wine test, which I want to talk about in just a minute. It, the amount of material produced it has actually been enough to clog up a sink. Uh, it's, it's very uh, unfortunate, but it's, it's, it's a fact that we're talking about a, a significant amount of material that can be seen. And with that, I wanted to reiterate 
um, the question of whether or not you would like to perform this test that Dr. Scott has established and discovered. And it is a test. It is not a cure at all. For those that are refusing to disclose this information because they're worried about liability, you, there is no concern on my side about presenting the factual truth and especially if, if it's observable and repeatable. And this is a test that you have discovered and established which leads one to, to ask for themselves and to answer the question for themselves as to whether or not the issue that we're speaking of is real. And I'm going to put a photograph up here at the end that shows the results of that test. And it's quite simple, you know, using uh, the wine as you described. People can look at the site or your paper, uh, but it's basically uh, uh, swishing, gargling your mouth with a dark red wine. Uh, again, controversial with the peroxide thing, whatever the mix is. But this is real physical material that we're speaking of. Which and you have sampled and shown under a microscope. Uh, repeatedly. This is not something that, that's anomalous at this stage. Right. We're up to 26 people that have voluntarily uh, performed this test. Unfortunately, all 26 of them are showing the presence. And this is a question that I ask you, to you. If, if you do not think that the general population, the broader population is involved in this issue, I urge you to consider uh, performing this test if you do find that uh, your gums and mouth expel any material, uh, solid material of a fibrous or stringy network after you perform this test. I encourage you to start asking some very serious questions. What is the nature of that material? Why is it there? And then also you figure out how to get rid of it and we've made some progress. And, and with that, um, I wanted to thank you very much, you. Gwen, for being here thank again, you. a second in a series, and I hope to continue. And we'll get the information out as best as we can. And, and thank you very much.